Welcome all for today's webinar, um, hosted by Shockcare. I am your facilitator, Wes, and our speaker today from Ro Revolutionaries of Wellbeing, I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly, is uh, the lovely Sarah McGuinness. This webinar is recorded, everybody, so, um, so please, um, it's for our learning purposes, and we will also upload it to our YouTube channel next week. So if you want to maybe go back and uh, really listen to today's interesting webinar by Sarah, just go over to our uh, YouTube channel and find some other interesting stuff there as well. Guys, your, our mic, your mic is being muted today. So if you want to chat to me, please use the chat function. Any questions for myself or Sarah, please make use of the quality, well, not the quality, the questions and answer functionality down below. Um, so please, um, all questions will be read out of that. If we have some time at the end of the session today, we will uh, open up the lines um, if we've got that time. Sarah, if I might, I was just going to go to the next slide for me, please. Mm -hmm. Um, there will be a couple of poll questions throughout today's session, guys, so uh, please be aware that all live results are anonymous, so please feel free to answer honestly. Um, and then um, quickly, something about shock care before I hand over to, to Sarah is that we've got a couple of work streams um, that you can look at or can visit and, and engage with us. Sarah, just click enter for me, then that'll, that'll pop up as well. So one of our work streams is critical risks and within critical risk work streams, we've got an exposure report, which is done and dusted and we'll be making public in a very near future. We've got a couple of hierarchy of controls. So please run over to our website and download those. Hierarchy of controls for those who don't know, is just a, a bit of a snapshot of a critical risk and what are all the, the controls in various for, in various elements in those, uh, um, of that risk that you can, um, basically take hold and implement within your organization. So those hierarchy controls is basically what we do is uh, from a overall ethos point of view, we are trying to connect people to people and people to solutions. And that's just another solution that we provide when we really want to make a healthier and safer workplaces sooner within New Zealand. Um, we've also got a couple of guidance material on there, guys. So there's seasonal guides. There's also a driver safety guide on there. So please look out for those. We really worked hard on those driver safety guides with uh, AA. So um, please go over and have a look. Another work stream we have is VAB. For those who don't know what it is, it's violent and aggressive behavior. And these are towards public facing um, workers. So this is your cashier or your merchandiser or anything, anybody that's customer facing. And they, you know, they've been increasingly getting more and more abuse, including violence. And, you know, COVID has not been kind to, to a lot of folks as well. And people are a bit more, unfortunately, a bit more angsty uh, these days. And that puts a lot of pressure on these individuals just trying to do their work. But we're doing some work with Skills VR um, around the VAB, how to de-escalate de a situation and how to train up workers more in that area. We've got another project going on as well, but unfortunately I can't talk too much about it, but definitely keep your eyes out for that because that's going to be a big one. Site markings, we, um, we've we been approached by WorkSafe to help out with site markings project. So that's going on with one of my colleagues and I can't speak too much about it there just yet because they'll just refine the little finer points. And then lastly, participative ergonomics. Um, that's just a really fancy word for manual handling, guys. Uh, for those who don't know, but um, early intervention, that's our main focus, how we can prevent those in injuries or any discomfort turning into injuries and how to manage those injuries once they are. And as well as we've got first move manual handling training on our website, just go over there and, and click on it and register and make use of it. Then lastly, guys, uh, Sarah, if you just click one more time for me then, um, we've got a couple of webinars coming up in this month still. We've got Paul Walsh and Craig Webb, and they'll do, both do a tag team session on personal safety and crowded places strategy. Um, what I've seen and what I've heard so far is going to be a really amazing, really fresh um, perspective on this. So please watch out for that. And make sure that you register early um, and do reserve your spot. Lastly, we'll have the lovely Jemima from GM for Security, and she will also be focused on sharing her wealth of knowledge when it comes to personal safety. Then um, I just want to quickly say we'll, we'll go over to why we are here today. As I want to mention today is thank you. We appreciate you, um, Sarah McGuinness, you know, from Roe. Um, 
she is a, I want to collect my thoughts here, guys. Um, she's a well-being disruptor, burnout awareness advocate as well, and a founder and CEO of Row Revolutionaries of Wellbeing. Sarah brings a wealth of knowledge and experience. She is also a passionate mental health and well-being champion. So gift again, Sarah, welcome to today. We really appreciate you taking the time and sharing um, your experience with us. So I'm going to hand over. Guys, I will still be here. I'll be monitoring the chat functions. So I'm one click away. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Wes. Awesome. Well, welcome along, everyone. And I can see there's, um, I can see the participant there, but of course I can't see your lovely faces. So I'm just going to have to imagine that you're all sitting there smiling um, and looking happy <laughs> um, today. So yes, hi, my name is Sarah McGuinness. Um, my, my journey has been a really interesting one because on the one hand i'm a well-being expert so i have a background in psychology um, among you know various training um, but also i burnt out so i didn't take my own advice and so what i want to share with you today is a little bit of the insights around what i knew and what i've always talked about but also some of the really hard lessons i've learned along the way one thing I will say before we get started as well is I can never really know what's going to feel close to the bone for you today because we're all going through different things. So if there's something I mentioned today that you think, oh, actually, that makes me feel a bit funny, please feel free to seek help, whatever that looks like, through your organisation or through 1737. We will reference uh, some help support um, lines at the end. But asking for help is probably one of the strongest things you can do. And it's one thing that I did in my journey, and it definitely made a really big difference. So I can promise it's not going to be a heavy 60 minutes or um, 50 minutes, but um, I do think it's really important to acknowledge that because, as I said, we are all going through different things. And hey, there's a lot going on right now, and we will talk about that a little bit as well. So to get started, you know, burnout is everywhere at the moment. You know, teachers, uh, police, medical profession, um, you know, it's almost in every industry. And I would say that almost every workplace would have someone who is on the verge of burnout or going through burnout at the moment. And burnout has personal consequences for the person, for their families, for the loved ones they have around them, but also for organizations as well. You know, if someone's not able to operate at their full potential, then already you've got challenges for, you know, how the work can actually get done and whether you can actually be productive and all those really important things that we know, um, you know, need to happen in a workplace. When I shared my story of burnout, so I burnt out in late 2020, I think the number of stories, so I was uh, in the media on TV3 and in stuff and various other news channels. When I shared my story through the media and on social media, the number of messages and emails and phone calls that I received just showed how utterly pervasive burnout is and how many people are going through something either that is burnout or similar to burnout right now. And it just says to me, this is absolutely an issue we need to pay attention to. And I learned the hard way why it's the issue we can't afford to ignore. The straw that broke the camel's back for me, so to speak, was an email. So a simple email arrived in my inbox in late December 2020. What did she say? Late 2020, middle of December. So it wasn't quite uh, at Christmas time. And it just had some simple feedback on my business. And on any other you know, normal year, it would have been like, oh, great, that's awesome feedback. Thanks, I'll, I'll carry on with that. But when I received this email in my inbox, I literally had no resilience left. And I looked at the email, the bottom of my stomach just sank and I closed my laptop and I went and sat on the couch and I just disintegrated into tears. And I just thought, what is wrong with me? Why can I not cope with a simple email? You know, I just don't have the energy or, or anything left right now to be able to deal with this. And so I called 1737. And the woman on the end of the phone was amazing. And she said to me, you sound like you need to take a day off work now, immediately. What's something you'd like to go and do? And I said, oh, I suppose I could do yoga. And she said, oh, that, that sounds like you should do it, not like you actually want to do it. She said, I'm going to ask you a different question. What does 14-year-old you like to do? And I said, oh, she likes to read. And she said, I think what you should do today is take yourself into town and go and buy a book or go and buy or, you know, go to the library, whatever it is, go and get yourself a book that you can absorb yourself into for the day and make that your first step in stepping away from whatever's happening for you right now. So I did. I went into town and I brought two books. And sadly, I still haven't read them. <laughs> and nor have I got my stuff together. <laughs> 
Uh, but what I did find was it was the start of a very long journey in getting well. And I'd like to say that this was the, the lowest point, but it actually wasn't. I want to tell you a little bit about some of that journey as we go along today, because as I said, there have been some, some really hard lessons I've had to learn and some real light bulb moments too. So I've been seeing a clinical psychologist as part of my recovery, and she's asked some really great questions. And one of the first questions she asked me on the very first session was, tell me about a typical day before you burnt out. What did it look like? And I just want to show you this image. So this is taken from my Instagram, which I have to say is no longer up because it got hacked two weeks ago. Love that. Um, but this is me doing a throwback to November 2021. This, the video that I did there was taken just after midnight. And I was talking about how I just had another coffee and was just about to get into some more work. And yeah, as I said there, don't do this at home. Anyway, so the question she asked me was what a typical day looked like. And I found that, you know, when I reflected on it, I was like, oh my goodness, this just seems, it seems crazy in reflection, but I'm going to tell you what it, what it looked like at the time. So I said to her, I get up really early in the morning and, you know, I've got to get my kids out the door. So often what I'll try and do is get like a little bit of work in before I get the kids up and then I will rush everyone out of the door. It's always such a scramble, you know, trying to find shoes and school uniforms and everything else. And then I pile everyone in the car, drive quickly to school. We're normally just getting there as the bell's ringing. I throw everyone out. I drive back home, get on my laptop, and I work intensely for all of the hours that the kids are at school. Then when I go and pick them up, I realize, you know, on my way that I haven't had lunch. So usually I try and sort of, I will grab something on the way out from the fridge or, you know, I'll actually go without lunch. Then I'll pick them up from school. I'll either take them, run them to their after school activities and I'll take my laptop with me and I'll be typing away quickly while they're at their after school activities. Or I'll be, um, you know, trying to, Get them to do something after school and i'll be squeezing in more work then we have dinner and then i get the kids to bed and then i will probably work till yeah midnight or well after and the psychologist said to me how does that sound to you and i said well if someone else told me that i would say that was crazy that sounds like a really intense day to do day after day but the really strange thing is that seems really normal to me and it had become so normal that I had actually lost touch with what it felt like to be um, not feeling as stressed or as busy or as manic as I was then. Maybe it's a good time to ask that poll question now, Sarah. Yeah, great one. Guys, we've got the poll questions, as we mentioned. So first poll question is a, a single answer question. Most of you on this call are potentially from a health and safety role, but to what extent do you feel you can take care of yourself and your own well-being with the same amount of dedication that you do for the workers you are responsible for? So it's not at all between not at all and some other time, some of the time between all the time. We'll give another five seconds or so. Okay, I'm sharing the results with everybody. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> and not uncommon, actually, for people in caring roles, you know, pe people focused roles, actually. Good, good. So I'll let you carry on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Thanks everyone for responding to that. As I said, it's really interesting to see. Uh, you can close that with, or I can close that. There we go. Um, really interesting to see, you know, how how you're feeling in that stage because, yeah, particularly when we're in caring roles and we're used to being focused on others, then it is really easy for our own self care to to drop off the bandwagon, and it gets even harder to to role model what it should look like. And we are going to talk about that in a little bit as well. So before we go much further, let's just click back in here. One thing I like to, to come back to is, you know, when we're talking about burnout and well-being and all those sort of concepts, you know, what are we talking about? And I know each of you will have, um, a, you know, a model probably in your workplace that you refer to, whether it's to Foy Tabitha or Five Ways to Wellbeing, or maybe you've got your own wellbeing model. Um, perhaps, you know, you've referred to one of the ones, there are some global ones that have anything from eight pillars. I've seen one that has 21 pillars. You know, wellbeing 
is really broadly defined, although we do know that there are some things that in well-being that are really critical. So that, whether that's your mental well-being, your physical well-being, and your relationship with others. Then beyond that, whether it's you know your finances or your um, you know the environment around you, all those sorts of things. But the reason that I I want to bring back to what is well-being is I want to make two points here. And the first point is that, as I said, there there is a number of, number of factors which are consistent across different well-being models. So there are some things that we know are, are really important for people to be able to look after their, their well-being, like mental health, for example. But also well-being means different things to different people. So normally when I run this as a presentation, I would actually take this time now to say, write down a, you know, a couple of words, but what, what well-being means to you. And typically I find people say things like feeling calm, feeling satisfied, feeling in control of my life feeling like I'm able to spend time with my loved ones and, and work and do all the things that I want to do and, and not feel stressed about it. So it's really interesting to me the types of language that people use when they describe what well-being really means to them. So those are my two points here. I think the other thing when it comes to well-being is we often, and look, you know, particularly if we look in the media, it's really easy to jump to solutions and to jump to, well, how do I feel better? And it can end up a little bit glossy in, in what well-being actually looks like. And I think it's really important, especially from a behaviour change point of view, to address the issues and challenges. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about some of those things, because these are some of the things that contributed to my burnout. And I know there'll be things that are causing pressure and stress for you and for people in your organisation as well. So let's talk first about why does it feel hard to balance work life and everything else? And look, it's a really complex answer, but there's three things I think are worth addressing here. The first is that the priority and value of work first leisure has changed. So leisure has tended to be marketed now as a luxury and we've put the value of work as you know, almost the pinnacle of, of prosperity and of being, of being successful. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to address because we know that you need rest and res restoration time you know, to recover, to be able to work well. And you cannot do 100% of one at the expense of the other. It's hard to imagine, you know, 20, 30 years ago, when, especially when computers first came in, they thought that technology was going to get so great that we were going to have all this leisure time. And there were these articles saying, what are people going to do with their leisure time? But we all know all we did was work more. So there's a, a conversation for us all to be having there. The second is less boundaries between home and work. And what's interesting is this was already a challenge before the pandemic. You know, technology has changed the way in which we work and our accessibility 24 7. Now with the pandemic those boundaries have become even more blurred and look you know for someone who works at home like I do then that's actually been you know it's been good because it's normalized a lot of the way that I work equally I have to be with some really clear boundaries around what that looks like and as I, I'm going to talk a bit more about this has been one of my challenge areas. And third, we live in an infinite world now. So if you think about all the music on Spotify, all the movies on Netflix, all of, and, and Amazon, and all the podcasts available, and all the things that you can buy from the supermarket, and all the things, it's just this, like, net, the internet has every answer. There's this infinite world that we now live in, and our poor brains can't cope with this infiniteness when all we're really craving is some, like a little, easy, structured, concrete little, little thing for us to live in. So there's this constant balance, balance for us about feeling like we're missing out when there's so much sort of an inf infinite world out there versus also just realizing that we only have a small sphere within our control and time that we can valuably spend on the things that are important to us. Now, again, I'm going to write what I, say what else there. You're welcome to put some things in the chat. Perhaps we can come back to those at the end. And there are other things that we haven't mentioned because I've got one more list for you. So in my... Uh, honours research, which I did hmm, about eight years ago now, I looked at midlife adults, so those between the ages of 30 and 60, and I was looking at eating, eating behaviours and, and body image. But one of the things that I did was I sat down and I wrote a list on the research. What are all the things that adults go through you know, in, their, in their life? And actually, when I started to make the list, and you can see there, it's really wide ranging. And you're like the sandwich generation. You're looking after the younger people. You're looking after the older people. You're managing your life as well. There's a lot that happens. Now, not everything on that list is stressful. Some of those things are really exciting. I mean, amazing when you're able to, you know, buy your first house, all those sorts of things. But equally, some of those things can be really stressful as well. So it's really important that we acknowledge that, hey, you know, there's a lot on our plates right now. Then this is the final one. 
Within your industry, I know that there are a number of challenges as well. So you've got things like the government response, the pandemic, which has changed from levels to lights to, you know, even within the, the lights and the levels, there were changes all the time about what it meant to be, you know, in level three now, this level three, several months later, the supply chain issues. And that's, you know, right from manufacturing and, you know, further up the chain right through to delivery, you know, customer expectations, when people are dealing with all those, you know, bricks on their shoulders right now, people are starting to get a little bit more titchy and more demanding and people just have less resilience like I mean like I said that I did we've also got staffing issues and hey look in Queenstown we've got uh, we'd be like anywhere in the country really short staffed in so many of our businesses because it's really hard to get you know staff who are able to do the skills that we need them to do but also just available for the work and then if they're away with COVID well then that makes it really challenging and there's also the lack of control and the financial pressures that go with that as well Plus, there's also big stuff. We've got you've got Ukraine, we've got climate change, you know, the global economy. Like, if you're not if you're not feeling stressed by now, um, I'm not trying to induce that on you. Just so that you know, what we're trying to do is just acknowledge there is a lot going on right now, which is why for a lot of people it just feels like there's this this kind of heaviness, this thing going on. And I think the more we acknowledge those things, then actually we're able to get some really great solutions and some good preventative measures in place. So let's just talk quickly about this too. So we used to talk about this idea of work-life balance, but I mean, obviously we haven't talked about that concept for quite some time because it doesn't make sense, right? Work is part of life. What we prefer to talk about is how satisfying your life is right now. Because if we break well-being down to, as I have in those eight categories, and as I said, you can choose eight other categories, we can start to say, hey, there are some good parts of my life and there are some less good parts of my life, but it doesn't mean that the whole thing is completely out of whack. It might just be that there are some, some areas I need to work on and some that are, as I said earlier, going really well. Now, normally when I do this as a presentation, I would actually take, take you through that opportunity and you will get a workbook in the follow-up email after this that will allow you to, to take this time so you can sit down and go, okay, well, how satisfying is my life right now? How is my mental well-being on a scale of one to five? You know, how is my connection with my community? Now, the, often when I run this, this is the first time that people have been through the opportunity to look at their life in, in compartments like this. And I used to do this in a presentation that I'm almost embarrassed to say that I used to give. It was called Living Your Best Life. And <laughs> that was before I burnt out, so I wasn't living my best life. Um, and I used to encourage people to do this, and yet I never did it myself. If I had done it myself in the lead up to my burnout, so in early 2020, I probably would have said it looked something like this. So, you know, pretty good across the spectrum, you know, I'm, I'm going really well, I'm, I'm thriving. But actually, if I'd been really honest with myself, it probably would have looked more like that. Lots happening in the workspace and then, you know, consequently, the financial space was going well, but it came at the expense of everything else. And that was really hard for me to be honest with myself around that, partially because, you know, my job is in well-being and who wants to admit as a well-being person that you're not coping? You know, I, that's part of the stigma I want to change. Just because you're in a well-being or health and safety or HR role doesn't mean that you have to have it, you know, perfect. We're all human. So it's just about being vulnerable and acknowledging some of those things too. So let me share a little bit of my journey with you. So we'll go back to 2016. I had just had... Well, I had two kids quite close together and I was trying to get my fledgling well-being business off the ground. And I was trying to do all the right things for well-being. I was trying to exercise and eat well and all those sorts of things. But I just found that I just felt so tired all the time. And I thought, oh, maybe my iron levels aren't great. So, or something like that. So I went to the doctor and she ran some tests and she said, no, no, everything's fine. You're, you're probably just a tired hormonal mother. So I carried on and, and kept trying to do the right thing, even though I just felt like I was, you know, running out of energy. In 2019, we moved to Gisborne. So my ex-husband worked um, in a, a construction company. We moved around a lot for projects. So when we first moved to Gisborne, I put aside the business and I focused on settling everybody in. And my symptoms cleared up for a bit. But then slowly but surely, I started to feel tired again and like I just didn't have a lot of energy and and my mental health wasn't feeling that fabulous so I went back to the doctor she ran more tests and said no you seem to be fine you know carry on just keep doing what you're doing and I just kept thinking what is wrong with me why 
why can I not get this right? I'm doing all, I'm following all the solutions that I know that I should do. I'm trying to exercise. I'm trying to eat well. I'm trying to meditate. I'm trying to go to yoga. I'm doing all these things, but I'm just not feeling any better. And I, I just can't quite work this out. Anyway, we got to lockdown and like most businesses, we had to pivot. So we moved from being a well-being research and strategy organization to embracing our community. So that was a rebrand. It was rebuilding the business from the ground up. It was supporting members, as I'm sure many member organizations or you and your organizations would have done. You just threw everything at it. You know, how do we help people? How do we support people? And it was a really, really big year. And slowly but surely, I was working longer days and sleeping shorter nights to the point where I almost felt like I was delirious. And I... I just kept trying to think, it's only for a short period of time, it's only for a short period, I just have to get through this. Funnily enough, I did an Instagram post around, it was around May, June in 2020, and I said, I think I'm burnt out. When I didn't realise that what I had was just fatigue at that point and not truly the true burnout, there was a long way to go. So between burnout and my email gate, which I referenced at the, the beginning of the presentation, my my work ethic became to the point where being up at midnight was becoming a normal a normal night for me and working and working well past that as well um a friend of mine who has bipolar she rang me and she said you seem you seem manic not my kind of manic but like you're addicted to work and i was i mean my work encompasses all the things that i love you know talking to people and helping people and um you know doing things like this and connecting and I just gave and I gave and I gave and I gave and I just didn't put any of the, the priority on, on myself and my own well-being. So by the time I got to email gate, I just, I had nothing left. We then got the call, this is at the end of 2020, we were supposed to be moving to Nelson. And a couple of days after email gate, we had this phone call from my ex-husband's work to say, you're not moving to Nelson, but you're going to Queenstown. So in the space of about two weeks, we up sticks out of Gisborne and shipped a whole houseload of stuff and children and a cat all the way down to Queenstown. And of course, you've got to set up a new life and new schools and the rest of it. And I was so unwell by the time that we got there that I could hardly get out of bed. And I went to the GP there and she said to me, I'm actually really concerned that you have lymphoma and I want to see you in, the, in an emergency as soon as we can get you an appointment. I had scans early the next morning and I am so thankful to say that I didn't have lymphoma, but I was really at a point where my body had given up as much as my mental health had given up. That got me to Invercargill. So by the time I was at Invercargill seeing a specialist, I, I remember sitting very clearly, sitting outside the office and thinking, right, I'm going to get well, this, I'm going to find out what's wrong with me, number one, and at this point I'm really... I'm willing to donate my body to science. Like <laughs> I was going to ring the Otago Medical School and say, please take me. I will do anything. I'm just, I want to know what's wrong with me and why I'm so sick and why I'm so unwell. Number two, I'm going to get well this time because I had burnt out before and had panic attacks before and anxiety and all sorts of things and never got properly well. Like got well for a bit and then gone downhill and then got well and then gone downhill. So it's going to get really well. And the third part was I was going to share my journey because I thought, you know what? If I can be vulnerable and and tell my story then that's going to enable others to and if i tell other people to speak up about it i've got to do that too so with that in mind when i finally saw the specialist in vicargo and then i saw another one in christchurch as well i got my final diagnosis which was burnout unsurprisingly fibromyalgia which is a chronic illness and adhd and now the interesting thing between fibromyalgia and adhd is that both of those things are linked to a lack of dopamine in the brain so my brain has something around dopamine that it doesn't do all that well so it's as much biological for me as it is you know psychological and probably sociological as well so yes went to christchurch got those diagnoses and then finally we had lockdown again um you know at round two in 2021 and what i noticed was really interesting I started, even though I had got more well by that stage, I had started to go back down that track of working long hours again. And yuck, it was such an easy thing to fall into. And it was such an eye-opening thing to go, oh my God, that doesn't take anything for me just to fall into that. So that was a, a real wake-up call. Now I'm, I'm at the question, one of the things I've challenged myself is what does better than well look like? And I'm, I'm really well mentally, but I want to be at a point where I don't go down again. And so this is kind of fresh off the press news and I'm sure it'll be another presentation much longer later. But um, yeah, I walked away from my marriage. And so that's been a really big part of this year and, and learning to rediscover who I am outside of that. I'm not going to dwell on that one. 
The other thing I just want to share with you before we move on is I wear a, a Garmin watch which tracks my heart rate and my stress levels. So the stress levels are based on your variable heart rate. The one you can see with the orange there, those are levels of stress. And 100% is really bad. In fact, I don't actually know what happens when the orange bars get to 100%. But that gives you an idea of the physiological side of what was happening to me when I was under so much stress. And that was day after day after day. The one with lots of blue lines on the right with the right hand side for me is what my days look like now. And you can imagine the stress that my body was under and probably how, you know, the damage potentially that I've done um, living like that compared to what it's like now. So what is burnout? Let's get clear on that. Uh, you can see it on screen there, but I'm going to talk briefly to them. So the emotional exhaustion is just like this absolute exhaustion. It's not just fatigue, it's bone wearying exhaustion. The feelings of indifference to work was really confusing to me because I love my job, I love what I do, but I just had this, this lack of motivation that I, I felt confused about. The negative or the reduced productivity was again kind of linked to the motivation. You go to do things and you just can't get your brain to coordinate itself. I got a whole lot of quotes for an event for an event. Um, some, some hotels we were going to run an event at and I couldn't even read the paper I couldn't compare the quotes I had to get someone else to because my brain literally couldn't take the stuff off the page and into my head uh, and then negative feelings towards the job as you can imagine if you're experiencing those other things then you're going to start to feel you know like it's really difficult let's get clear on once not to so it's not stress or fatigue so we know stress you know you, you can have some good stress we all need a little bit of stress sometimes to get things done but same with fatigue. If you go away on holiday and then come back and you're feeling good, you haven't got that stress of fatigue anymore, that wasn't burnout. It's not depression or anxiety. So you can get depression and or anxiety and have burnout. Those things are, are absolutely linked, but they're also separate as well. And we know depression and anxiety have particular characteristics around them, which we see in the DSM, which is our clinical guide when it comes to, to mental illness. Um, and so those things tend to stick around even when environmental things change. It has much more bi biological focus um, in those. It's not categorical. So burnout, and I love this because Jared Haar from AUT describes it as a piece of toast. So unlike depression or anxiety where there's some clinical guidelines around, burnout's like a piece of toast. It sort of gets slowly more and more and more burnt. And there's no point in the burntness or from the, you know, cooked to burnt in which we say this is the point in which you are burnt out there's just a gradual um, you know scale um, and where you feel extra burnt out might be different to where someone else feels really burnt out it's not an illness or a medical condition either and the, the world health organization has been really clear and that it's a workplace symptom or um, phenomenon which means that what we would expect is that if you remove yourself away from the workplace and you get well then the symptom should uh, disappear so the signs, what are you looking for in yourself or others? So that lack of energy, um, you can see the things that are there. I'm going to pull out just a couple. Um, the unexplained physical symptoms is a really interesting one. So that's, again, uh, often a behavior of which I did, but which others would do, where you keep going back to the doctor going, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. The tests aren't showing anything. You know, perhaps it's time to look at what else might be on the table. What are some of the stressors in your life? That self-medication. So yeah, if you find yourself drinking more, probably a good time to reflect is the drinking more of it connected to doing more work or what's happening in my work life and the forgetfulness oh my goodness yes i i have trouble retaining i had trouble retaining so much stuff um really simple things and that was really frustrating the other one i just want to mention as well as languishing which is a word that corey keys is a sociologist talks about so if burnout doesn't quite feel like your thing but you're feeling more then that might be that you're languishing at the moment and lots of people are it's languishing is the sense of not feeling like we're thriving but we're not exactly in the in the depths of despair as well it's this kind of in between feeling and it's worth recognizing that there is a word for it and just like with burnout there's some things that we can do to help prevent it and to recover from that as well so what do we do i love this cartoon one of the things I'd like to say early on that was a, a lesson for me was that no matter no matter what I thought about recovery and no matter how easy I thought it might be being a well-being person or you know I hadn't had all this knowledge 
actually recovery was really boring and really mundane and it was all these tiny little decisions i made every day sometimes that would help me take steps towards recovery and sometimes i just didn't make great ones and that's fine and i think the key there is that you're trying it's the same in organizations you know as a health and safety person as an hr as a well-being person there'll be some great things you try and they'll make a difference in your organization and there'll be some other you know day-to-day -day things that you try and they don't go so well the main thing is you're trying and you're trying to move in the right direction I think sometimes, yeah, we this is kind of glossy appearance of people laughing with salad or all those sorts of things. But actually, as I said, most of it's these little micro decisions you make every day. The other thing that I learned too is that prevention and recovery from burnout are essentially the same thing. So what I'm going to talk through here in my lessons learned and some suggestions for you is I'm going to, I've framed them around five myths that people shared with me when I was going through my burnout recovery. And I started sharing it on social media right from that day in Invercargill. So right from when I was really unwell all the way through to recovery. And it was really fascinating with some of the things that, that people presented. And I was like, well, that's not true. So the first one was people let themselves burn out. Like no one lets themselves burn out. No one chooses that as a thing. Why would anyone choose such a horrible experience? Like, no, no one chooses that. So let's unpick that. First of all, it's, it's helpful to understand what causes burnout. And there are kind of three main factors. So there's individual factors, there's some work factors and environmental factors as well. So individual factors are if you're unfortunately a type A type person, you know, perfectionist, high achiever. Um, I have to say that I probably have the t-shirt and the name badge and the crown for, for being that sort of person. Um, but if you're also a really compassionate person, you invest a lot in your job, those individual factors are obviously really positive and we love having those in the workplace, but also there can be a tendency to over, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, kind of over, I was going to say overindulge, wrong word, but overcommit and, and put more of yourself in there without giving yourself that time for rest and restoration. The work factors, and we will come to that in a little bit of time, so I don't want to spend a lot, of, lot there, other than to say they are things like long hours, but also things like lack of control. And we, as I said, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in just a moment. And environmental factors. It would be remiss of me not to mention things like the pandemic, because that has absolutely changed the way in which we, we live and we work and the pressures that people are under. So we can think about all these things as bricks, bricks in a bucket. And the heavier the bucket, almost the more likely you are to head towards burnout. There are two other things I think are worth mentioning here. Now, these are probably less in my story because I worked on my own, but in a workplace where I've had previous burnout experience, absolutely 100%. So the first thing is that psychological safety. And most of you will know what that is, but that's that ability for you to be able to speak up and feel that you can trust the environment and trust the people around you that if you speak up, it'll be okay. It's that ability to ask for help and to know that you'll be okay and you'll be accepted for that. And the second part is the psychological contract. So, and I often see this in organizations where, you know, the onboarding, we do all the rah-rah, it's amazing to work here, look at our values. And then actually when you get working in there, we set people up to fail. So we've promised all these things and we haven't delivered on them. And both of those things play such an important role in how people engage in our organizations. So as leaders and managers, there are some things we can do to help make sure that we have a psychologically safe environment and that we keep that psychological contract as strong as we can. And that comes all back to relationships. So being vulnerable with people that I have leaders tell stories all the time about their own well-being and some of the challenges they've been through. And that has absolutely changed the environment and, and the culture um, when they are when they do do that. You know, we want to communicate with and not to. We want to get comfortable with mistakes and as much as we can resting in empathy and again if we have more time i've got some great stories around each of those but i think if you come back to going how do we have strong relationships at work that will enable us to be able to have better conversations and people be able to speak up when they need to so what we can do again you'll get this in your workbook but one of the things i suggest you do and you can do it on your own or do it in a team is actually write down what are all the bricks that you're carrying at work or your team is carrying at work. Now I've given some examples there. So some of it is around some work tasks for me, some of it's around some you know, personal health, like recovery from COVID-19. But if you start to go, right, what are all the bricks that we have happening you know, in our team right now? We can go, well, that's a lot of bricks. You know, if people are carrying that much, you know, how do we support them with that? And I really recommend that as, a, as an activity because it will help you realize how heavy the load is. 
what you can do then is you can get your scissors out you can cut out all the bricks and then you can work out which ones you have lots of control some control and little control over and again this is a really helpful one because what that will help people do is work out okay where can i where do i need to put my focus because one of the things with burnout is it's really easy to kind of take on way too much and if we start to go look if you focus on the things that you have lots of control over that's always going to be a healthier approach so if I think about in your roles, it you know, absolutely depends on, on where you are in, in your organization, the type of work that you do, but the things that you'll have lots of control over are your immediate work tasks, more, you know, your time management, how you interact with people. Your some control will be you know, your interactions with others, so how they respond to you. Um, deadlines you might have some control over, and when things are due, um, even how you create campaigns, for example. Um, the little or no control would be things like the government's response to the pandemic We've got little or no control over it we just have to work within that framework so then once we've worked out how many bricks we've got and which buckets they're in the other important thing to do is what's your is to question what's your battery level right now so we can go how much energy do you actually have to carry all of those bricks and you know sometimes we can we might have a heavy workload but we might also be in a really good place you know mentally and physically and so we can carry that load for a while but if we carry that load for a really long time it's like you know carrying really heavy shopping bags we can carry it for a while but if we carry it on and on and on we're going to de deplete our battery and at some point it's going to need a recharge so if we think about this in terms of battery green is you know i've got lots of energy i can do this i'm good to go orange is i'm I need a little bit of you know support and, and time to recover, but I I can keep going for a bit longer. And red is I definitely need a recharge. Now I know where I've remembered this time. There's a poll. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Uh, let me launch that poll. Here we go. What level of battery are you operating at right now, guys? Green, orange, red. Um, Carol uh, Carol mentioned in the chat. You know, for her it was. Um, you know, a matter of a self-awareness and what the root cause of her insistent working was. And when she understood imposter syndrome, um, what it looked like, she was able to realize what it was. That's awesome. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I 100% agree with that. Yes, Cal, thank you for sharing that. Okay, cool. Let me share the results with everybody. There you go. Mm. Mm, a lot of people at half charge. And I'd say that's, that's really common right now you know really common I'm, I'm i'm happy to see there are some people at green too um it's good to see that we're still you know able to, to get on and get through those things <laughs> awesome so again this is a really great one and i know some organizations use this in their team meetings um you know or or in conversations with people to go you know how are you going and using a, an easy metaphor like this makes it yeah a super simple um conversation to have so the last thing in this one is just to say, who's looking out for you and who are you looking out for? One of the things that we know from wellbeing research is that we're not always the best judge of our own wellbeing. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, on the outside, I would have said that I was doing really well when I really clearly wasn't. So you need people around you who can, who know you well enough, who can call you out and say, you know, how are you going okay right now? I'm, I'm noticing A, B and C, you know, how, how are you going and actually have those really good conversations and conversely who can you do that to in people in your life who can you be that who you know in your life can you be that person who says hey i'm noticing something about you and i just wondered if you want to have a coffee or a walk or something like that for me as i said my friend hannah rang me and and said you seem manic and that was a bit of a oh do i okay okay myth number two you just need to toughen up why don't you quit your job i wish it was that easy um, my uh, colleague of mine um, shared a story with me, which is they had someone who went through burnout or was burnt out, quit and left their job, didn't have the strength to go and find another job, ended up in a financial predicament. And thankfully this workplace took that person back, but that quitting a job is not necessarily the, the best answer. So this is when I was saying about work factors. So the health and safety executive in the UK has these six management standards that we can look at in a workplace. And if we, we look across them, so there's demands, how much demand do we have um, you know, happening in our, in our roles? What control do we have over our work? What's the support like from our peers and from our manager and, and relationships? So how you know, thriving are they versus toxic? Um, how much, you know, what's our role like? And I'm gonna to have to move myself because I'm right in the way of that last one. 
um, the change as well. So what's change communication like in, in our workplace and how, how does change happen? Now, if you had the opportunity to work along each of those dials, you could either do it for yourself, your team or across your organization and go, where are we thriving in those areas? And where are we heading to danger? And obviously the more of those dials that you've got heading towards danger is, is an indication really that there's potential for burnout in your organization or for yourself. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there is some information for that on the workbook. And I really encourage you to look at the Health and Safety Executive in the UK at their website for more information on those things. The other thing is about boundaries. And again, I'm just going to talk really briefly about these. Um, but I think it's important to address because, as I said, I noticed that with the lack of boundaries, that was one of the big indicators to me that I was sliding into a not so great place. So there are three types of boundaries. So Rigid, if we've got really rigid boundaries, then we don't tend to share very much with others. And that can be really healthy sometimes, but also not very healthy if we're looking to kind of get support. So if you can imagine a fish in a bowl going, this is my little patch and I'm not moving, that's a very rigid boundary. You can also have porous boundaries. So that's going to imagine a fish in a giant sea. And this is honestly what most of us who are you know, caring, we care a lot about other people, we give and we give and we give, we don't have any boundaries because we want to keep looking after people and supporting them and what else can I do and I'm passionate about my work and da 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 da, da and those, those boundaries just disappear. What we want to aim for is these healthy boundaries when we've got this fish in a pond where the pond sometimes extends and, and the, you know, we're able to sometimes, you know, leverage ourselves a bit further when we need to, but we've also got some hard boundaries that we say, you know what, I'm not going to do that because that's going to impact on my well-being. I'm not going to pursue this relationship uh, or I'm not going to work like that because that's a boundary that I'm putting in place. Okay, so boundaries, very important. And again, as I said, some of these things are really big topics. And so if they're nothing else, I want them to be signposts for you to have a think about and you can look at in the workbook. Number three, burnout isn't real. It's just in your head. Um, thanks for that one <laughs> to the person who shared that with me. Um, what I would like to say is, you know, a lot of people said to me in sharing my story, oh, you're really brave. You know, it's really great that you're sharing it. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not that brave. I'm like, well, actually, I decided that it wasn't bravery because if you looked the worst case scenario in the eye and the worst case scenario would be that no one would buy my well-being services and I'd be left all alone, what would I do? And I was saying to my dad, I would have moved home. I would have got a job in a supermarket somewhere and my family would have still loved me and I'd be okay. But the big message out of all of this was that when I shared my story in the media, there were so many emails and I put a comment up there, which were frankly a bit abusive and derogatory and questioned, you know, my experience of burnout. And I came away thinking, I'm fine with that because I put myself out there and I still do, you know, I'm very open about this. And as I said to Wes, you know, I've I wasn't to wear, sorry, I was talking to my, my colleague Chris yesterday, you know, I, I am fine for people to ask me any questions, so please put them in the chat. If I don't want to answer it, I won't, but I'm very transparent about my journey. Um, but I worry about other people who read the commentary that I've received who then won't stand up and talk about it. They won't ask for help. And so what I ask of you is to be a wellbeing champion. Be that person who stamps out those, those comments and those conversations. I'm sure you already do. But the more that we do that, the more that we make it easier for people to stand up and talk about their own experiences. Number four, why don't you just meditate more? And in fact, after my stuff article, I got this very, very long email from someone detailing how to meditate the videos I should download, their experience of their family members with meditation. I thought that's really nice. But actually self-care and getting better and building some of this into your life to prevent burnout is much more challenging and much more complex than that. So the one thing I would say is self-care is not in recovery and prevention. None of them are a passive process. They're an active process. So when I look at mine, I actually have a biopsychosocial response um, to my self-care plan. So what does biological mean? That means I take two antidepressants every day and that helps my brain with, with getting well. And I've, I've spoken to lots of other people who've said the same thing. Actually taking them enabled them to get to a place where their brain could then do the next things to help them get well. You know, I also come from five generations um, of, of people with, with mental health. So I'm already up against it biologically. So no amount of running or eating well is going to change that. Um, number two, in terms of the sociological, so as I said, I've been seeing a, a clinical psychologist. I graduated at the end of last year. I was waiting for the streamers from the ceiling. They didn't come, but 
that was been a, that has been a huge help. And, and the sociological, so surrounding myself and people that make me feel good has been really important. And, you know, I've got some really close friendships now with people and who have been, you know, lifesavers literally. And I think the more that we can build those community networks, the better. So again, in your workbook, you'll see what does self-care mean to you? And there's an opportunity for you to write down what some of those things are. You know, whether they're little things like getting into bed with a, you know, a book or whether they're big things like getting into nature or whatever it is, but really important to build in every day. Okay, the last myth is you just need to take it easy. And again, I wish that it was as easy as this, um, but recovery, prevention, anything like that related to burnout, it has to be a proactive process. So I was thinking about my recovery and, and thinking about some of the models and behavior change and you know what kind of steps I took. And I thought, actually, the, I can call it the three S plan. And the first step was to stabilize myself. So prioritizing care. I almost think of it as a patient coming in um, into triage, you know, the, the person's been in an accident and they need oxygen. Like that's the, they need, you need to stabilize the patient. That's step one. Step two is then to strengthen. Okay, so they're now in, in the ward in the hospital and they can start to maybe build muscle capability back, and if I'm using this analogy. So for burnout, that would be learning more about yourself. And I, I love that example earlier, learning more about imposter syndrome and, and perhaps starting to implement some of those solutions. And then number three was sustain. So this is where I'm at now. How do I keep staying well? How do I make sure that I don't go backwards, um, you know, and, and prioritize that as part of my life. Now with this plan, you can do this as a team. So again, you could go, if we're in the stabilize, what are some of the things we need to do for our individuals in our team or for the team in general? How do we prioritize care when things are really, really tough? And then when there's a bit more time, how do we strengthen? How do we build more knowledge? And these webinars through ShopCare are fantastic for that. And then sustain. So again, that's looking at some of those six dials that we talked about. You know, what are some of the things that we can do to dial up or dial down as we need to? So you can do a bit of a plan. And again, the workbook is an opportunity for you to do this. And do it for yourself too. And it's quite an interesting one to think about. Well, if I was, if I was in a place like I was when I was on the couch and really sad, you know, what would 14-year-old you like to do? What would be the thing that would make a difference for you? So in wrapping up my presentation, I guess there is a couple of things, you know, to share with you. One is that the risks of inaction when it comes to burnout are too great to ignore. Time. It took me a year to get well. You know, do you have that kind of time to get well? And I'm lucky that I run my own business so I could be flexible about that. But that cost me, it cost my family and it cost my, you know, my business in terms of the time I was able to spend with them. And obviously it's really expensive personally going to a clinical psychologist and seeing specialists. Um, but also for my business as well. And then relationships, you know, in the end, you know, as I said, I've walked away from my marriage and there's been some other really significant relationship changes in my life. And so this hasn't been a small thing. It's been a really big life-changing event. And so we cannot afford for people to keep going through those, knowing those are the costs. So I leave you with this. This is me in Queenstown wearing my t-shirt that I used to wear before I burnt out, which says, you are remarkable, be kind to yourself. And I wish I had been more kind to myself early on. And I leave you with this quote from my friend, Miley Cyrus. In fact, she's not my friend, but I wish she was. <laughs> Which is, there will always be another mountain. I'm always going to, going, to, going to want to make it move. And if you think about the last sentence, it's the climb. You know what? Enjoy the climb. Enjoy the time that you have to spend on the things that you love doing and make it worth it. Don't you know, end up in a place like I did where you end up losing out on so much. So we're just before we finish, I'm just going to leave that one up while we, while we um, take the questions, if you like. But yeah, follow me if you want to on, on LinkedIn. And um, we've got a podcast with some really interesting people. Um, I, Susie McAlpine wrote this book on burnout. I love it a bit. Um, you can get that from most good booksellers if you're after more information. And of course, those support lines there as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, guys, we've got one poll question before we go into the questions. Um, so I'm just launching the poll question. Um, has this webinar been of value to you and inspired you to do things differently? So either yes, I found it really a lot of value and I'll do something differently or great to obtain confirmation of what we do already. Or, hey, you know, this wasn't for me. <laughs> so really, really interesting. Uh, while, while we wait for people to answer that last one, um, you, you mentioned, the one, we talked about something earlier on and someone also mentioned it in the comments and, 
you know, it's it's sad that some uh, workers decide to leave an organization instead of trying to create that change. What advice could you give that person, especially if they feel like they, they backed into a corner? Oh, that's so hard. If I think of... Um... If I think of a situation, so I was in Melbourne and I was working in a, um, a, an organisation and there was a huge amount of change and I was brought over to do a leadership um, course. But that was one of those times I can think of I was set up to fail. You know, I don't think the organisation was truly invested in running the course. Um, and, and my job was pretty much a nothingness job and I was sitting out on my own in isolation. So all the, all the things that we know that aren't ideal. Um, you know, I think in that situation, one, if you can find a mentor or a sponsor or someone else in a different division who can can be a support or can help can help you in some way whether it's being able to move to a different role or um or can help you see the longer picture or or someone even external like a mentor who can say look this, these are industry-wide issues um you know here's what i've tried and, and whatever those things can be really helpful um, i think whatever you can do to talk and as i said earlier you know have those conversations first before you take any action is probably my, the advice i would give Excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. Um, I, I would love, Dixie, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, um, she shared something really interesting. She said, I struggled with saying no to people that could come to me for anything and everything. It came to such a point that I was burning, uh, burning me out and I had to learn to take control of the situation and turn it around quickly. Also, my manager's support was important during that time, which helped me push back. I had only myself to blame as I realized I had laid the foundation for people to come to me for anything and everything at the time, rather than using their own way to find what they were looking for. Mm, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I absolutely, you know, the reference I made at the start was I, you know, the behavior in the end I, I had to change was my own. And, and part of it, I can blame the environment that we were in, but you know, I'm, I'm a perfectionist at heart. And so part of me telling my story is addressing the perfectionist thoughts in my head, which is like, you can't do that. Don't do that. People will judge you. You know, you're not perfect if you do that. I'm like, no, I'm not. And, and I have to change my way of thinking for it to change. So yeah. I absolutely, well done. Huge, you know, commend, commend the person for that. If we can just go to the next um, two slides, please, uh, Sarah. Um, yeah, I'll click on that one just here. To and then, oh yeah, let me get out of that one for you. Let yeah. Here. There you go. Oh, I think you in One more. One more. One more. Oh. There we go. There we go. Um, guys, basically that's uh, all the time we have. If you have any other questions uh, for Sarah or myself, please drop us on uh, line. There's our contact details. Um, as I mentioned before, guys, um, please visit our YouTube channel. We will also have this webinar on there um, by next week. Uh, so please, um, from before I, before I go and hand over to Sarah for one last word, I just want to thank you, everybody that took the time today to participate in the polls and also listen and uh, learn from what Sarah had to share today. And then lastly, Sarah, thank you yet again for taking the time and your willingness to share your journey with us and your experience. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that got a lot of value out of today. Oh, thank you very much. Well, and I, you know, I say thank you as well to, to those of you who have been in those roles like I have too, and, you know, have thrown yourself 100% at, at it. I know the pandemic has been really challenging for us all. So you're doing an amazing job. Keep going. And yeah, drop me a line and share your story. I'm always happy to commiserate with someone else. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, guys. Uh, so that's it for today. Um, until next time, I hope I see you at the next webinar. Well, then, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.